Nellie Wartoff, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Big thanks, John. Glad to be here. It is a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for joining me. You are joining me from Singapore. It is 12 midnight uh, for you. It's <laughs> it's uh, morning for me, 10 a.m. in uh, south of Salt Lake City in Utah. I'm really excited today to talk with you because you're an expert in the area of social learning. And we're going to talk about utilizing social learning in your enterprise learning and development strategy. So we talk a lot on this podcast about learning and development and reskilling and upskilling and, and all of those sorts of efforts within organizations. Uh, I'm not sure we've ever focused specifically on that component of social learning and how it can can and should be integrated specifically mm -hmm. into L&D uh, efforts within an organization. So I think this will be a really great conversation. As we get started, I wanted to share Nellie's bio with everybody. Nellie Wartoft started as a young entrepreneur in her early teen years in Sweden. After winning several trophies in skeet shooting, Nellie turned her attention to educating the elderly on the internet and digitally and digital literacy to improve their quality of life. This social enterprise was more than a passion and a purpose for her. It sowed the seeds of her journey in social learning. At the age of 18, Nellie booked a single ticket to Singapore to build her career in business in what she refers to as the most buzzing and happening part of the world. And I've heard the same thing about Singapore. Uh, that's wonderful. In her first foray into the corporate world, uh, at Michael Page, Nellie rose through the ranks and was the youngest executive in the company to be appointed practice lead and become a top biller at the age of 23. She's placed over 150 executives into sales and marketing roles in Fortune 500 companies uh, within the financial, legal, and consulting technology and media sectors. It was during her time as a recruiter that she spotted a stark skills gap that she was determined to fix. She saw that there was a need to refresh the way businesses, business professionals leveled up their actionable insights from industry experts. This led to the launch of Tiger Hall in March of 2019, a mobile SaaS platform for social learning, revolutionizing how professionals learn from one another. And I could really go on and on, but I'm going to pause there and give you a chance now, Nelly. Probably to... short on that bio. <laughs> no, 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 it's great. And I'll pause there though and give you a chance now to highlight anything or, or reiterate anything that you feel is of particular importance. Um, for me and my listeners, just by way of context, as we get started. Yeah, I think you captured it very well and all the details were there as well. I would just emphasize probably like my experience and why it came to social learning, why I'm so deeply passionate about this topic is, first of all, my own experiences in education and how I just hated university. And I know that you're a professor as well, so, <laughs> so that's going to be an interesting conversation, but I thought it was a it, It's okay. Experience. Not everyone needs to love university. That's fine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And I thought all of this money and time that is being wasted, it's it's just not a good fit for what you're going to do later in life. And then after that, I went out to work in recruitment. And I thought initially, like, I'm probably the, the only one that had a crap university education and didn't really learn any real skills. And then when I worked with all of these candidates, I noticed that, hang on, it's actually just not me. All of these 4.0 GPA students, they are still studying the four piece of marketing and Porter's five forces and Hofstadt's model and all of these things that they come out and work and employers are like, I can't use you for that. <laughs> I'm not going to hire you. So that gap was very much what led me to start getting really deep into this topic that we're going to chat about today as well. So, um, so that's where it originally came from too. Yeah, that's fantastic. And just in defense of uh, higher ed, um, again, this is not a competition and not everyone needs to love their university experience or even go to university. I'm a big believer in that. Um, yeah. and there's a whole variety of paths towards learning, uh, in skill development and, and certificates and, and micro badging. And like, there's all sorts of things beyond just the traditional university experience that are certainly relevant. Um, you're right, though, all universities aren't created alike in terms of how the curriculum is structured and how they try to help prepare their students for the real world. Uh, and one of the things I really pride myself on at uh, at my university and that we give a ton of attention, it's like the primary attention that we give to the development of our curriculum is to be deeply embedded within industry, to constantly be getting industry feedback on what our curriculum is and mm -hmm. what we're teaching to our students, and that all of our students are getting lots of opportunity for skill development, where they're doing applied learning projects, experiential learning, working on consulting projects with real, real companies as they're going through our courses, all that kind of stuff. So by, by the time they leave, the whole idea is that our students are shovel ready, like they're ready to hit the ground running, not just with theoretical knowledge, but with practical, you know, applied, actionable 
knowledge and skills and capabilities to help organizations succeed from the get-go. And we're not the only university like that. Um, there are lots that try to prepare students in similar ways, but that's something I'm very proud about at our university. And to your point about your less than uh, wonderful experience, um, I think there's lots of universities that are, are being a little bit too slow to catch up to kind of this new world that we're in, in terms of yeah. learning and development needs. Yeah. And my counter to that would be, what about if you work those years instead, actually make a salary, you don't end up in debt for life. Would that be a better way of learning those practical skills? So, but that's a- Well, right. And that, that gets into the discussion around affordability and the rising yeah. costs of higher ed. Man, there's a lot of stuff we can unpack there. Um, yeah. <laughs> all great points. Well, good. Um, let's unpack this then and talk more about really what it, what is social learning? How do you describe that? Uh, and then we can get into your learning platform. Um, well, how LMS uh, has been trying to do that in recent years and, and what your platform looks like. Yeah, yeah, I get a lot of questions around what is social learning and like, how is it defined? And some people view it more as like peer-to-peer -peer learning, which is correct. And some people view it more as social media, which is also correct and tends to like pull a lot of those different aspects in together, right? But I think an important thing to think about is just like the why behind social learning and why is it so effective? And if you look at when people in the workplace are facing a challenge right now, the most common way for them to solve that challenge is to reach out to a colleague and to ask a peer within the company and someone that, that they trust, right? Their solution to solving problems is not to go on and watch long videos or go into an LMS or go into a formal course or sign up for a university or anything. Their solution is, hey, can anyone help me with this? I have a one-to-one -one coming up with my team. How do I solve it? So that's the foundation. That's how most people are solving their problems today. And if you look at that in a learning context and you look at like adding some, some stats to back it up as well, right? Like when you look at social experiences, for example, when you learn together with other people, the retention and understanding is increased by about 90%. So, and that's compared to around 5% when you listen to a keynote speaker, 10% when you're reading a book and 30% when you watch a live class demonstration, right? So 90% is a super, super high retention rate. And that comes from this, that you're not only learning on your own, but you're learning from others, you can reflect together, you can discuss together, and you can think about things from different perspectives as well. So what social learning really is, it's in summer, it's three things. It's learning from other humans. So and when I say humans, I mean, real world, people are working in the real world. It's not instructors, professors, trainers, keynote speakers, it's people are out there in the real world doing these things live. You're learning from human beings. So both people that are outside of your company, outside of your industry, just like the best in the field, but also people that are next to you within your own company, within your own team and so on. And the second thing is that you're learning this together with others. So you're not on your own absorbing knowledge. And most of the online courses, if you look at MOCs, for example, like they force you to watch 27 hours of video content on your own in front of your laptop at home. And I'm like, the only time people would do that is if it's Game of Thrones or Squid Games or something, they're not going to sit and watch 27 hours of a leadership development course, right? So making it together with others, having those social interactions, like the world is social. Look at where people are spending their time. They're spending it on Instagram and TikTok and all of these platforms, right? And there's a reason behind that. So that's a big part of it. And then the third is the technology behind it. And looking at like leveraging social technology, you have so many effective ways of leveraging how people are interacting, like tapping into existing user behaviors. Because looking at what people are doing when they're scrolling feeds, they're chatting, they're listening to podcasts, they're watching stories, like this is how people are spending their time every day. So why don't we tap into that instead of asking them to watch this 27 hour video course and forcing them into user behaviors that they don't have? Why do we have to create new ones? We can just tap into the behaviors that they already have. So, so that's the third part of social learning is tapping into those user behaviors that are already existing on the social media platforms and so on. So, so that's in a nutshell what it's all about. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I agree with you. I'm a huge believer in the value of social learning. There's lots of different ways to go about implementing it. And the, your, your, your comment about the online learning that's just a bunch of videos, is, is it lands well with me. Um, that is not good. Uh, course design, that's not good learning design. Um, that's not oh. going to be helpful to almost anyone. And unfortunately, traditionally, that's what 
online learning has looked like. Um, exactly. The good news is, the good news is there's lots of technologies that can be utilized if we can get creative um, and push ourselves out of our comfort zone a little bit. And I am talking from the university side, but also the corporate side, because corporations mm -hmm. are just as guilty of this <laughs> in terms of their their uh, um, their training and development programs and what they put out. Exactly. And so let's be more creative, though, utilize the technologies that exist. In some cases, maybe we'll come up with something new, create our own new technology that's going to enhance things further. But there are so many great interactive ways um, to leverage, even if people aren't together in person to, to do social learning. Um, and then when you're together in person, there's tons of ways to go about doing it. And we just need to make sure that we're keeping that at the forefront. When I think about adult learning theory, for example, um, just reading stuff, just sitting there in a lecture and listening to stuff or just watching video, that is the worst. It is not going to work and resonate for almost anybody. A very small proportion of the population will get anything out of that. And so what you were sharing about, you know, those statistics around retention, you're absolutely right. We we retain almost nothing when we're just passively sitting there, you know, hopefully absorbing, you know, information. So we need to yeah. be doing, we need to be applying, we need to be co having conversations, we need to be self-reflecting, we need to be going through all that kind of stuff in a continual way. And if we're not, then it's just going to be a lackluster experience for everyone involved. And it's, it's training is expensive. And, and you talk about like creating a 27 hour video course. If you have high quality video, that's expensive. Yeah. Why, why invest so much money into a, a crap course? That's not going to do anything. <laughs> exactly. And I think where the, the biggest mistake where I see most organizations have gone wrong is that they've somehow equaled quantity of content to quality of learning. No, like that, that is just a complete mismatch. Like you can't say that we have 50,000 videos, so we have a great learning experience. That's like, it's almost the opposite. The more quantity you have, the worse it is, right? And just like throwing a platform at people where it's like, go into this platform, you have access to 50,000 videos, you go and watch what you want, learn what you want. Like, why would anyone go in there? Nobody goes in there. And that is the challenge that most organizations are having, right? They roll out these LMSs and LXPs and nobody's using them. And it just sits there like a pink elephant and nobody's touching it because it's not tapping into what they want. It's not personalized to them. It's not tapping into their user behaviors. And that's, that's not successful at all. So I don't know where this quantity of content equals quality of learning came from, but that was a massively wrong track that I think the corporate world went on. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, we need to disrupt that way of thinking. Absolutely. So tell us more specifically now about your platform uh, and how you're you're helping organizations to utilize social learning uh, in their learning and development strategy. So the way that we do it is that we look a lot at business impact and what is the business goals. And that's another big mistake, I think, that has been made in enterprise learning for a long period of time, is that it's treated as an isolated part of the company. And this is both on the business leaders and on the L&D leaders. So it's not that only one side is to blame, but it's been very much that, okay, learning, like tick box exercise, roll out this platform, tons of videos, here we go, we've done it. And then people are happy and then it doesn't drive anything. And then you ask people, what is the RI on this? Why are you doing it? What is the purpose? And they have no clue, right? So what we do is that we design from business challenges and what are the problems that you have in the business? So these could be things like we're struggling with a mindset shift for our digital transformation. We're struggling with a merger and acquisition, the integration, the culture aspects of it. We're struggling to get meetings with CIOs for our sales team. And if you're a tech company, for example, we're struggling with transitioning to insure tech. And a lot of it is around commercial growth, digital transformation, leadership challenges, like first time managers, we're seeing high attrition because we don't have good first time managers. So it's those kind of business problems that we then design for. And how we do that is that we develop content together with what we call Thinkfluencers, which we have about a thousand of around the world in the US, Europe, and Asia. It's a very, very diverse set of Thinkfluencers. And all of these Thinkfluencers are C-suite, senior leaders, or subject matter experts in some of the world's best companies. So we have people like the president of Adobe, the CTO of Microsoft, the CMO of EY, machine learning scientists, and a lot of different people that are on the platform sharing their knowledge. So what we do, if you say, take the first time manager use case, then we look at the audience that you have in the company, we do the audience segmentation, and then we personalize curated journeys for those audiences, for those business problems, 
where you get to learn from the best in the industry, the best from different companies and the best people out there. You do it together with your colleagues, together with your team. So it's all of these social functionalities with feeds and chats and discussion forums. And it's very, very social. And the formats that is delivered in is very much like an Instagram, TikTok, Spotify experience. So everything is very bite-sized. It's 10 to 15 minute podcasts. It's five, six minutes power reads. It's two to three minute videos. So very TikTok style and it fits into people's lives. So we have users average about 64 minutes a week on the platform because they fit it into what we call their micro moments. So when they're picking up their kids from school, when they're walking their dog, when they're cooking in the evening, even when they're showering in the morning is like the second most common use case when they pick it up and, and learn on the go. So, so we help them fit it into their lives, make it personalized to their problem statements and what they're facing, and then tie that all back to business impact. Um, so that's how we solve a lot of business challenges for our customers. And then we do audience segmentation, look at different use cases, and they can roll it out across the entire company in that way. But it's a lot more focused, personalized, and targeted than just a blank, one-size-fits-none yeah. LMS solution. Yeah, I, lo I love it. And I think you, you've made reference several times to different social media platforms, such as like the TikTok experience. And that is so addictive. Like you, you get into TikTok and there's, you know, I was watching a show the other day, um, like a Hulu show. So an ad came up midway because we don't pay for like the nice Hulu subscription. We do the ad based one <laughs> and uh, an ad came up for, I think, I think the hashtag was, I learned it on TikTok. So it, the whole yeah. point of the ad was learn an upskill on TikTok with the, like these yeah. short 30 second or one minute things. And then like you get these life hacks or you learn these different things and skills on TikTok. And I'm like, huh, that's super interesting, <laughs> but it is, it's so addictive. Um, they, they've really cracked the code. You know, I, I'm sure there's, there's more innovation to happen here, but the, the algorithm is very effective at uh, helping uh, draw people's attention in and ha hanging on to it. And so, yeah, if we can find ways to, to have those micro moments, uh, with our people to give them the chance to reskill and upskill as like an on, on an ongoing basis. So it's not something where like a couple times a year, you go to like a two day retreat and you get some training mm -hmm. or, you know, whether that's in person or you watch all these videos on in on the e-learning platform for the organization or whatever, like those types of approaches we're never super effective, but we're, we're far past that in what the technology will allow us to do in a meaningful way. And so let's, let's adapt and, and, and get, going with with some of these other approaches. Um, I know the World Bank says that over a billion people will need to upskill and reskill by 2030, just the shifting nature of work, uh, disruptive technologies, automation, like all those sorts of things. We just need people with different types of skill sets. What does all this mean as a billion people uh, that need to reskill and upskill by 2030? What does that mean for L&D going into the future? And what do you see as those most important skills and competencies, capabilities that are going to be necessary in the coming decades? Yeah, it's a crazy amount of people, right? Like a billion people need to upskill and reskill is like impossible to fathom how, how big of an audience that is to cater learning for. And I think it's interesting because it's very much going in two directions, right? So if you look at the skills and the knowledge and talent that is in demand, it's very much going away from what, what people used to like study and what people used to do and you see it going in two directions so either you go down the super technical route and that's where we see a lot of demand for data scientists like can't be enough data scientists in the world <laughs> I don't know how scarce they are 3d printing ai ml all the metaverse coming up like all those technical areas that's one side of it but then what you see on the other side that is becoming even more in demand or the soft skills, right? Or what I call power skills, because it's actually the most powerful skills you can have. And I just read an article in Harvard Business Review earlier today that was about the, um, the C-suite and the most critical skills in the C-suite. And they had looked at job descriptions in the past 20 years and seen that it was 30% up for skills like social skills, communication, empathy, all of those, and like 30% down for industry expertise, managing uh, financial and material resources, and all of those traditional CEO skills. So you see it all the way up to the C-suite, and it's skills coming up like growth mindset, change management, a lot of communication skills, communication, collaboration, teamwork, things like agility, uh, learning agility, all of these areas come up. Creativity is a big one too. And this is what we see also with 
the customers that we work with, for example, when they do leadership development programs, it's many of them that now start to incorporate a lot more social skills into those leadership development programs and not only it used to be more technical, right? Like this is how you do a one-to-one and this is how you do this and that. Whereas now it's more like just developing social skills, relationship building and and all of those um, areas. And it used to be more that you did relationship building as a means to an end, but the end was still achieving the business outcomes. Whereas now the relationship building part of it and the communication, that's almost number one. And then business outcomes are secondary. So I think that's been a very interesting change. And it is this very clear divide. Like it's super technical skills and super soft skills. And there's almost nothing in between that will be left because all of that will be pretty much automated. Yeah, and autom- automation is not new. It's It's been happening in the entire history of the world. We always come up with new creative ways to make things easier. Uh, people talk about how we're in the fourth wave of the industrial revolution right now with the disruptive technologies and the, the advanced robotics, AI, deep yeah. machine learning and such automation. So we get, sometimes people are scared of it and resistant towards it, but that's, it's, it's just part of the deal. Like that's, that's how we progressed um, as humans and as societies and as organizations for forever. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we can resist it or we can figure out how we're going to adapt and adopt, you know, these technologies. Uh, and and I, for one, as I think about these skills for the future, I love the idea of automating m- most, if not all of the more menial, repetitive types of tasks to free up my time to focus on the more creative, strategic, relational, you know, those sorts of elements of the work that I do. I, I think that would be fantastic. And I think that would be a great benefit to a lot of people around the world. Um, and so tech, you know, like you said, the, the dichotomy between the technical skills and the power skills, um, both are super important and, and we just need to help people develop those. And I see all the time as I work with leaders and organizations, um, most don't have the level of capability and, and competencies around those power skills uh, that are yeah. necessary for them to lead the organizations of the future. And so if we're going to have a dynamic organization, a learning organization, an innovative organization that consistently, you know, that sustainably and consistently provides value to the market in the future, we're, we're going to have to get people uh, with these capabilities or we're going to be left behind. So let's look for, for more creative ways to reskill and upskill our people. Um, utilizing these types of the social learning approaches and the technologies available to support it. I think all of that will serve us well. Well, Nelly, it has been a real pleasure. I know the time I need to let you go so you can get to bed because it's late. Uh, (laughs) But before we wrap up for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can connect with you and find out more about your work. And then we'll wrap up for today. Sounds good. So uh, feel free to connect with me on Nelly at tigerhall.com. I'm very open with my email address and anyone can email me. Um, and then of course on LinkedIn, I'm very active on LinkedIn and share many of my thoughts and so on there. So feel free to connect me, with me on LinkedIn or Nelly at tigerhall.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nelly. It's been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Nelly and her team can do for you. Check out her approaches to social learning. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe. You can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you'll have a great week.